Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and his desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a bag vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I have be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Well, first of all, can I thank Chris for the uh, welcome. It's good to be back in uh, Bethesda Narbeth and to this harvest service. It's good to be here. Uh, to remember once again God's goodness towards us, His faithfulness, uh, His faithfulness to His promises. To Noah, He promised seed time and harvest. He promised uh, the seasons. And uh, uh, thousands of years since, He's been faithful to His promise. And we've received, well, uh, from His hand every day all that we truly, truly uh, need. Uh, the lines have fallen unto us in pleasant places. Uh, but I want to turn to Genesis chapter 4 this evening, to the uh, account that we've read here uh, of Cain and Abel. It's not the account by Geoffrey Archer, but it's the original account uh, of the true Cain and Abel. Uh, and we read, of course, history here. We're not reading a fable, we're not reading a fairy story, we're not reading something that's been made up, uh, we're reading of a worship service. We've come here tonight to worship, we've come here uh, to a harvest service, and we read of a worship service, and we'll look at that, and we read really of how God accepts Abel's worship, and how God rejects Cain's worship. And it is true today that God accepts the worship of some and he rejects the worship of others. And we need to know, we really do need to know, is God accepting my worship tonight or is he rejecting my worship? And more importantly, is God going to accept me into his very presence or is he going to reject me from his very presence 
when we worship him in heaven? And that's the big, big, all-important question. <clears throat> so let's come uh, to Genesis chapter 4, and there are going to be just three points tonight. First of all, very simple points, God is to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped because he's God. God is to be worshipped because he's the God who has created heaven and earth and the seas and all that is in them, and he has created us. We're not uh, here by accident, we're not here because we've been formed by a process of evolution that's taken place over billions of years. You need more faith to believe in that than you do to believe in the Bible. We won't go into that tonight. But uh, we read in God's Word that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the one true and living God. He's sovereign over all people. He's sovereign over the universe. He's almighty. He's holy. He's uh, uh, righteous and just in all his ways. He's the God of truth. He's the faithful God. He's the God of love and mercy. We can go on and on speaking of him. Uh, but let's just remark, he's to be worshipped. And he is not only to be worshipped, my friends, in the quietness of our homes. He's not only to be worshipped as we read our Bibles, perhaps, or pray quietly, uh, alone, in our homes, uh, in our um, houses, whatever, but he is to be worshipped publicly. And this is what we see uh, happening here in Genesis chapter 4. It's not a novel concept, my friends, to gather together to worship God. It's not something new. It's not something that's happened only in Wales in the last 200 years when chapels have been built. No, no, from the earliest of times, God ordained that his people should come together to worship him at a particular time and in a particular place. And that they are to bring their worship and their praise and their offerings before him. And quickly this evening, I just want you to note that we see that Cain and Abel, uh, here if we read uh, in verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the, of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Um, you see, they came together. Now we've gathered together for harvest, but we gather together regularly on the Lord's day, and we should because God has ordained that his people should come together. And this is what Cain and Abel were doing. They were coming together to a particular place to worship. I'm not advocating a grand, by, uh, grand building, uh, but uh, the old nonconformists of Wales used to call their chapels meeting places. And it could be outside, it could be wherever, it could be in somebody's home, but it was a meeting place where man would meet with God. we meet with one another, and man would meet, more importantly, with God. And God has ordained a special blessing when his people are together. And we should not excuse the assembling of ourselves together. It was, I suppose, uh, a blessing to be able to do things on YouTube and on Zoom uh, during the pandemic. But my friends, that's not normal. It's not normal. And uh, we should not satisfy ourselves with a dose of YouTube, Zoom, or z sermon audio. We should not be satisfied unless we meet with one another uh, on God's day uh, to worship him together. Because this is where God, this here, this place, Naboth here, this place tonight, is where God ordains his blessing. This place tonight is where God says, I'll meet with you. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord Jesus, says, I am going to stand in your midst. I'm going to walk amongst you. And I'm going to minister to you. And I'm going to bless your souls. And I'm going to feed them by the means of grace. So this is uh, important. Now, they came when? And in the process of time, it really means at the end of days. Well, what days? Well, you can count the first day, the second day, 
the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, and then the end of days was the seventh day when God rested and he blessed the seventh day and called it holy. And it was a day set apart to worship him and to rest from daily labor. And so at the end of days, which was then the Sabbath day, they gathered together. And of course, now in the, the Christian uh, era, since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we meet on the first day, that is the Lord's day. That's the, God, the day that God has ordained that his people meet together. It was the day that the Lord met with his disciples the first time and said, peace be with you. Ah, but there was one absent and he missed the blessing. Uh, but the Lord was gracious again because the next Lord's Day, what happened? He met with his disciples again. Thomas was there and he said, peace be with you. It's uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came. And it was when? What day? The Lord's Day. And so on the Lord's Day, we're to meet together to worship God. And we're to bring our offering to the Lord. Now, uh, Cain and Abel, they brought physical offerings. And we'll look at them later on. Now, we don't bring sheep and goats and, uh, well, to this harvest service. Perhaps you brought uh, uh, some fruit or some veg or perhaps you brought some some, uh, some sandwiches for later or whatever, uh, but we don't normally bring those physical things. But uh, in the New Testament, the Lord says we do bring offerings. We're to bring our offering of praise. We're to bring our offering of thanks to the Lord. We're to bring our bodies as living sacrifices, which is a reasonable act of worship. We're to bring, uh, as the Lord has prospered us, our money to the Lord. To set aside every Lord's day, says Paul, a sum of money uh, that we may offer it to the Lord. And it's not ours really to begin with. What have we that we have not received? So we're not bringing something as ours. We're simply bringing something as the Lord's. But we're to bring our offerings to the Lord. And that's a very important thing. Because, my friends, so many people today ask, what can I get out of church? And, uh, well, you know, there have been times that uh, people have gone, I'm sure, from this building, and I'm sure have gone from, from Bethesda Tembe Road, and said, well, I didn't get much out of that today. And uh, along with the roast beef, they probably had roast pasta for, for lunch. But, uh, my friends, that's not what this meeting is about. It's not about what you can get out of it. When has it ever been something where you get something out of it? No, no. We're to come and we bring our offering before the Lord. We come as supplicants, we come as sinners, and we come and we bring our offering of praise and of worship and of thanksgiving before the Lord, and the Lord ordains, and it's a wonderful thing, he blesses us in that, that when we are fully engaged in bringing our worship and our praise and our years in the hearing of his word, and our attention, our full attention to the Word, and, and our prayers as the Word is being preached, that the Lord would work in our hearts and that we might be doers of the Word and not hearers of the Word only. Uh, as we bring all that before the Lord, the Lord is so good that we walk out from a, from a service and say, I've had much more from that than I ever brought. But if we think, well, it's all about what I can get, we'll go out empty. So God is to be worshipped. God's to be worshipped and we're here tonight and we're to thank him for another year. We're here to thank him for a harvest. We're here to thank him for food and for clothes and for all his, his earthly blessings towards us. And yes, we're to thank him for 
uh, our blessings in the Lord Jesus. We're to thank him for spiritual blessings that we receive from his hand. We're to come and bless the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us this year. But um, uh, the second point, and I said these were very simple points. We can only worship God through Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the second point. We can only truly worship God through Jesus Christ and him crucified. We cannot worship God any other way. Or to put it uh, another way, God will not accept any worship that is not brought through the Lord Jesus. God will not accept any one of us unless we come through the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the Lord Jesus is absolutely essential, absolutely central to Christianity, to worship, to our forgiveness, to our pardon, to any spiritual blessing we can have, and to heaven itself. Any other way is a closed door. And so, Let's come then to Abel and Cain, you see. Cain and Abel. You see, they brought offerings before the Lord. What did Abel bring? Well, Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. <coughs> Abel brought a dead lamb. And uh, Cain, he brought uh, his fruit. He brought uh, the fruit that he had grown in his plot. He, had, he was a farmer and he brought the fruit of his, his labour before the Lord. And you see, God accepted Abel's offering but rejected, rejected Cain's offering. And the big question is why? Why was it that God accepted Abel's offering but rejected Cain's? Now, there's another book in the Bible called The Letter to the Hebrews and it tells us that it's because Abel came in faith. It's because Abel came in faith. But what does that mean? Did he mean does it mean that Abel came hoping that God would accept his offering and Cain came not caring whether God would accept his offering? Is that what it means by faith? Faith is a very sort of, uh, you know... Um, um, kind of witchy-washy word to some people. What does it mean that Abel came in faith? Well, in order to understand, we've got to go back. We've got to go back to one chapter in the Bible. We've got to go back to Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is a very, very interesting chapter. It speaks about the fall of man. It speaks about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And yes, they were real people. They were historical people. It speaks of, of Adam and Eve and of that day when they rebelled against God. God had given them commands. Uh, God had given one command. Uh, he said, you can eat of any tree in the garden. And that's millions of trees. But you can't eat of one tree. And Adam and Eve said, oh, yeah, that's been stingy. That's what they thought in their hearts. And, and, and they rebelled. And they sinned. And for the first time, they knew that they were guilty before God. They knew that themselves to be sinners, that relationship they had with God. He walked in the garden. It was a perfect relationship with God. Uh, they, they, they enjoy God's company. God enjoyed their company. Uh, it, it was perfect. Uh, a perfect world, perfect people. That all went. It was all destroyed in one moment. Uh, and they fell into sin. And now the relationship was broken. And they knew God's displeasure. They knew God's... Um, 
um, just anger for the first time. And do you know what they did? They hid in the garden. They hid in the garden because they were afraid of God and because they knew that they were sinners. They knew that they had broken God's law and that they were guilty before God and that they deserved, uh, really, to, to be liable for their guilt. In other words, they deserved uh, the, the wages of, of, of sin. They deserved to be punished for the sin that they had committed. Just as, uh, you know, lots of us will be driving faster than 20 miles an hour. You know, we'll, we'll be, we'll, there'll be a camera one day and there the ticket will come through. And whether I feel guilty or not, it's there, I'm guilty. And I have to pay the price. Well, they knew that they were guilty before God and they had to pay the price for their sin. And you know what they did? They hid from God, but then, you see, they took fig leaves and sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness, it says. It was the first cover-up in history. Because what they were doing, they were trying to cover up their sin. They were trying to cover up their guilt. They were going to try to pretend before God that nothing had happened. Or they were going to try to find a way themselves whereby God would say to them, it doesn't really matter. They were going to try and hide, cover their sin uh, before God and hope that God would accept them despite what they had done. And so they sewed fig leaves together and you know God saw through it. God saw through it. He said, you know, those fig leaves are no good. I know that you sinned. Guilty. And I know that you're liable to bear the price for it. But there's another thing that God did in the Garden of Eden. I want you to bear with me just a few minutes. He gave a promise to them. It's the first promise of the gospel. He, it, it, until then, it was all bad news. They stood guilty before God, liable to, be, to die, liable to uh, be punished for their sin, with no good news whatsoever, with no hope whatsoever. And God came and he, he gave them a promise. He said, I'm going to send the seed of the woman. It's a very cryptic promise in Genesis verse 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 15. Very cryptic promise. But he said, um, I'm going to send the seed of the woman. He was promising Jesus Christ. I'm going to send Jesus Christ and he will deal with your sin. He will deal with what's happened. And he'll be the one that will make you or, 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 or open a way that you can be accepted before me. And then he goes on, not only does he give them a promise, but he gives them a picture. And it's a gospel picture, and I want you to grasp this. It's in verse 21 of Genesis chapter 3. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. What, what did God do? God himself took the initiative and he made them coats of skins. In other words, he made them clothes whereby they could be acceptable in his sight. But what had to happen for God to make those clothes? They were coats of skin. An animal, innocent, had to die. And Adam and Eve saw before their face an animal die. It's bloodshed. And through that death, they could be clothed, 
accepted before God. And they could come and draw nigh to worship him. And that all points forward to what the Lord Jesus has done. You see, he's come into this world, God's Son, and he's come for this purpose to save us. That we might be acceptable before God. That we might be accepted by God. And he comes, and what does he do? He, he deals with our sin, the barrier that separated us and God. He deals with our sin. And how does he deal with it? By going to the cross and dying in our place. In other words, he takes the, the price that we deserve to pay for our sin, and he pays it for us. He's our substitute. He, he dies in our place. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die, both physically and spiritually. And he, he says, I'll die in their place. And so he goes to the cross, and in my place, condemned he, he stood. And he seals my pardon with his blood. He dies that I might be clothed and made acceptable before God. Now, how does all this come back to Abel? Well, that's what it means when it says Abel came in faith. Because, you see, Abel, he was the son of, of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve taught both Cain and Abel. Do you know, now <coughs> that we're sinners, we must uh, come by to God in a certain way. We can't just approach a holy God. We just can't come into his presence without an atonement, without a substitute, without somebody dying in our place. And Adam and Eve taught Cain and Abel the gospel. Very simply, but it was enough. Taught Cain and Abel the gospel. If you want to approach God, if you want pardon and forgiveness, if you want peace with God, if you want to be reconciled to God, if you want to live in his presence forever and ever and ever in heaven, then you must come through an atonement. You must come through Jesus Christ. And Abel believed that. And so he brought an offering of a dead lamb because this was the shadow in the Old Testament of the Lamb of God who would give himself for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. So coming in faith doesn't mean he came just hoping that God would accept him. No, he came believing what God had said in his word. Having faith in, in God isn't just some wishy-washy thing. Well, I believe that there may be a God, you know, and I hope that he may accept me or whatever. It's believing, taking God at his word. Taking God, the God who's revealed himself in the Bible, is taking him at his word. Is saying, I believe what you say. I believe what you say about me. I believe that you, when, when the Bible says that, that, uh, that I'm guilty before you, that I'm a sinner, that I deserve to die, I accept that I believe that. And I believe also that you have found a way to save me from my sins in the Lord Jesus Christ. That you've sent your son into this world and that if I uh, believe upon him, uh, cast my soul upon him, cast myself upon him, lean upon him, lean heavily upon him, trust him for, for forgiveness and everlasting life and peace with God, then, then you will save me. And I take you at, my word, at your word. That's faith. It's believing God. Taking God at his word. Now you see, what did Cain do? Well, despite knowing what Abel knew, he brought the fruit of his labors to the Lord. He, he, he brought something and he said, no, I'll do it my way. Now I'm sure that Cain was a very, very good farmer. I'm sure that when he brought his fruit to the Lord, they were, bri they were brilliant tomatoes. You know, best of cucumbers with the one in, in you know, Martel Twice show. You know, I'm sure. 
And don't doubt that, uh, that he was a good farmer. Don't doubt that his fruit was lovely. But he came his own way. He was the very first person, if the song had been about it, to have sung, I did it my way. He is the original Frank Sinatra, my friend. Despite knowing this is what God said, he said, nah. No, no, I, I, I'll do it my way. I'll come with my, my offer. I'll come with my works. I'll come with my, 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 my fruit to the Lord. And, you know, he's, he's bound to accept, uh, accept that. And his arrogance, my friends. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just doubting, uh, you know, and, and saying, well, uh, you know, perhaps this will work. You know, it's sheer arrogance. If God has plainly said, this is the way of salvation, and he offers it freely, he's not stingy in offering it, and we'll see that to end. If God has said, this is the way of salvation, it's sheer arrogance for any one of us to say, no, I'll do it my way. That's why that song is such a song of pride and arrogance. Because it's, it's, it's putting your fists up to God and saying, I reject what you've said. It's not choosing some other way. Or, you know, if you're here tonight and you're, you're saying, well, I hope that uh, just that I've turned up once a year to, 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 to uh, harvest service will, will make me acceptable before God in heaven and that he'll accept me when I die or... You know, I just hope that I've lived a good life and all that. You know, it's not being sort of pious and humble. It's being arrogant. It's the height of sin. Because God's plainly said in his word, this is the way, walk ye in it. And to say no, that's just sheer arrogance. And Cain... I'm afraid, was a, a, an arrogant man. Uh, he was arrogant in the fact that he brought that fruit before the Lord. So, which way are you coming tonight? Which way are you coming tonight? You can come one of two ways. You're either here tonight saying, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Or you're here tonight saying, something in my hands I bring, to my goodness I do cling. And the former will be accepted and the latter will be rejected. I just want to end with these words by God. God says, if thou doest well, Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall his desire, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He says to Cain, you see, because Cain, you know, is angry. And uh, yeah, people can get angry with the gospel. I've seen a fair few people angry at the gospel. You know, they may not say it in words, but you can tell it on their faces. You know, I, I know when, when people are fuming inside, how dare you say this and how dare you say that. My, my friends, it's quite simple. If you submit to God's way of salvation tonight, you'll be accepted. You know, you'll be accepted. God says that to Cain. He says, you know, there's no difference between you and Abel in the sense of who you are. I, 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 I'm not partial, you know. I'm not saying, well, I'm not going to accept this person or that person, whatever. He says, if you come God's way tonight, if you come trusting in the Lord Jesus tonight, you can know all the blessings of salvation. You can know God. You can know your Creator. You can know your sustainer, you can have the assurance that you are pardoned and forgiven of every single sin you've ever committed, are committing, or ever will commit. You can know the assurance of heaven tonight, 100%. Uh, simply come. And if you come God's way, you'll be accepted. No doubt. 
He's never cast anybody out who's come to him in faith. Never. Never happened. Not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, uh, uh, not through 2,000 years of church history, never will to the second coming of Christ. If you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and cry out to him that he might save you, he will. That's what God is saying here. But, he says, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Sin is a terrible thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, us preachers, we, we say, well, you know, we preach on a Sunday and uh, nobody comes to Christ and we say, well, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Something always happens. One of two things happens. If you're a Christian, you're either, you're, you're built up in the faith by the word. Uh, but when it comes to the unbeliever, if uh, an unbeliever comes and believes and trusts, he's saved. But if he doesn't, it's not that nothing happens. What little heart of yours? Just guess that little bit harder. You know, the sun can melt water, it can bake clay. A little bit harder. Just that little bit harder. Week after week after week after week, month after month, year after year, gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And so it's not that anybody walks out from here tonight who is an unbeliever and says, nothing happened, something did happen. It's a tragic thing. That's why the Bible says, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you do well, if you come God's way, you'll be accepted. Take God at his word and call upon him that he might work in your heart tonight.